Rugby League is Graham Lowe's life. Whether it's the biggest names in the game or the local kids, the burning passion for the game he loves always comes through. Yeah, look, there's a big crowd here at Carlo, cheer him on. That's it, that's it, got to give him a cheer. That's the way, right away you go. Well, I've just had the hardest season without doubt of my career for many reasons and um, coming back here to Carlow Park just it just makes me feel so you know so bloody good and I'm so glad that I that I'm a coach and that I got into it right back in 1973. The year gets put into perspective when you come down here you're mixing with kids they couldn't care less about what's going on at Manly they're only inter interested in enjoying themselves and that's how it should be and they've made me feel real good. They say it's all about state against state, mate against mate. The State of Origin Series is one of Australia's greatest sporting occasions. It's a fiercely patriotic event where the best league players in the country represent their home state. It's an all-Australian affair. That is until Queensland chose Graham Lowe as their coach. It was a big controversial appointment because, um, and rightly so, especially for people in Queensland because they love the State of Origin team. They, you know, the it was Queensland's inception, the state of origin, uh, well, the whole concept. And they're very, very proud of the state of origin team. And um, uh, Arthur Beetson, who is, like, he's my favourite all-time player and he's a, he's a living legend as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he was the current coach and, um, and he'd led the team to the first initial victory and, like, he is state of origin and... Um, um, you know, for 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 Arthur to be replaced by by a New Zealander was probably uh, a little difficult for most people to understand and to accept. I've nothing against Graham Lowe. He's a good coach. He's uh, certainly a good bloke and that. But uh, I suppose really where the bottom line is, he's not a Queenslander. So, but, but that's their privilege. I won't go to the game. Wednesday night, I'll be here to watch it because Arthur Beast is not coaching them. It's the same of a Chinaman went over and run the All Blacks. As game one of the three match series got underway, it was also difficult to accept that Queensland could beat a star-studded New South Wales lineup. While we were aware that we certainly didn't have the, the individual brilliance right across the board that um, New South Wales believed they had, and, um, and everybody saw that they had, I felt that, um, that we could beat them in other ways. While we may not have the individuals, we had to try and work uh, and come up with a better team. You know, our, our individuals, uh, their, their bag of tricks was certainly smaller than New South Wales, but um, the thing is it had a zip in it, and um, if we yanked hard enough, we might be able to open it up wider than what, what the Joe Public thought. Graham put the emphasis on doing the little things right, on pressuring New South Wales with tough defence and isolating the runners who would be supporting that individual flair of the manly maestro, Cliff Lyons. They really had an opportunity there in New South Wales. You know, the players aren't dumb. They know, they can read the papers. They know that in some cases they're up against, you know, possibly the best bloke in the world in that particular position. But the thing is, it, it, uh, you should never be scared of anything like that. And um, if you approach it properly, if you approach it in a positive manner um, and, and with confidence, you can win. You know, that's, a game is not about individual versus individual. It's about teamwork. An injury to Gary Belcher gave a chance to the Broncos fullback Paul Hoff, a newcomer who needed some low motivation. Hoff comes at him. Good cover by Hoff. Paul Hoff was a, um, a newcomer into the team and also a newcomer to that level of football. The first couple of days of training, I, I called him aside at every opportunity I got and, um, and just tried to, firstly, the, the most important thing was to let him know that he was really wanted in the team. The main thing with Paul was he's such a reserve sort of a fellow, he, he, he plays the game a little bit too much for his support rather than taking the initiative and going on his own. 
and I think once we'd convinced him to do that, um, he was one of the sensations of the series. Elias, short ball for Gaia, gets a good pass away. Edlinghausen, he's over the 22, uses the kick, and again falls off. Rises to the occasion. Enormous pressure for the young fullback from Queensland. Willie Khan. Rousing tackle there by Ian Roberts. Lewis now. Hasler around the boot laces. They were just firing their big guns at us one after another. And I think not only to our surprise, but to their surprise, they got no return. Um, we had a call um, that, that I had initially named Tempo, um, and, the, and the call Tempo meant that if I sent the message out Tempo, doesn't matter how tired anyone was, doesn't matter what, they had to trust me and, and respond to it, and they just had to lift their tempo, no matter what, the tempo had to be lifted. Well, um, we worked on that all week, and just before we left the dressing room, I went outside and um, let Wally have a couple of words to the team on his own, and I since found out that Wally actually said, forget that word tempo, it's Queensland, and our call then was Queensland. Jackson, dummy half, looks to kick. Fainted Whenever we applied Queensland, the pressure took its toll on New South Wales, and somehow, I don't know, we found our second win. Steve Jackson, he puts his toe to it. Come down pretty hard, Joe, and there's the element. There we see Graham Lowe in the stand. He probably looks more nervous than anyone talking to Tossa Turner, the manager. They're all listening to Tossa Turner. He'd be pretty happy to see this go over from the boot of Mel Meninga. My Otahu College logic puts a second win down to a reward. You can never get a second win unless you've absolutely applied yourself in every way possible. And then, I don't know if it's the bloke upstairs or, or whoever, but for some reason and somehow, you get a lift and you kick on again. And that's what happened to us. Yes, he does. He's bending over in uh, some pain. Here's Lewis now. Lewis has got some support. Lewis holds it up. Melbourne eager. Can he get there? Be Can he get there? Fair dinkum. How would you like to be the one trying to stop him? I was just grateful he was on my side for a change. That Lewis-Meninga combination is one of the most formidable ever in rugby league. And gee, it was a privilege to coach them, even if it was only for three weeks. over the Maroons. Oh, listen to the crowd. Don't they love those two? Lewis and Meninga, the nemesis. By this time, the tension was almost too much. I couldn't sit in the stand any longer amongst those screaming fans. I just had to get down and be closer to the action. I decided to go down to the sideline and try and act super cool. Mind you, Tim Sheens wasn't having it too easy either. Queensland now. Holding on. Elias to the right for Stewart. On to Alexander. Floats it to Daly. Daly's kicks a grubber and a beauty. The try that Daly got was a brilliant individual try and very hard to guard against. You put it down to one thing, individual brilliance. Individual brilliance is just something that um, some players are blessed with and, and when they turn it on, it's very difficult to guard against. Connor probably hasn't kicked a great deal this season, won't have a, a greater pressure kick for many a day than this one. Michael O'Connor then had the chance to ruin the night for us. Um, there was a lot of pressure on him and I was thinking to myself, Michael O'Connor, if you kick this goal, Fair income, mate. I've seen you miss easier ones from Manly. You better not do it. 20 metres out. No, he hasn't given it enough. Thankfully, he didn't. New South Wales 4. But the match wasn't over. There was further drama to come. the first for the new series a penalty has been given at the halfway well when i realized it's that um, mel had kicked the ball dead the referee had awarded a penalty to new south wales and i was out on the field i'd run out there and um, i was just so embarrassed being a professional coach you're supposed to be able to remain cool under pressure but i was everything but cool and um, i looked around and i just felt 
like everyone in the stadium was looking at me because I made a spectacle of myself and you know by, by the time they got me over, back over to the sideline I just couldn't bear to watch the last kick and I think it was Alexander I think it was lined up to uh, try and kick it from halfway after the full time hooter had gone and, um, the relief when it didn't go over and I think Wally or somebody just caught it and ran it up and took the tackle and the game was all over I think it was probably um, it, it's one of the best feelings that I've ever had it was just absolutely unbelievable the feeling was just absolutely un unbelievable it was amazing because so many things flashed back through my mind um, that first game I nearly wasn't involved because um, I can remember back to February when I was laying in the hospital bed and the, uh, the management from Queensland came down to see me and they said, listen, Graham, there's no pressure on you to remain as coach. Or it's totally up to you. And, and the specialists had actually said to me uh, they wanted me to take six months off work. But um, I decided to, uh, to keep going and, and you know, to be involved with the state of origin. Well, I'm just quite so glad that I did because nothing will ever would ever be able to replace uh, the feeling that, that I got and the kick that I got out of, out of that uh, involvement, especially that first game. too hard because you've got to get down to the beach and back after the first match graham returned to his manly club site in sydney <laughs> facing the players he had opposed as queensland coach so i knew accepting the job would mean my own players would be in the opposing side or a number of them would and that in itself was was a bit of a concern but and but I, well i didn't think it would be too much of a worry i thought oh well you know it, it is only a game and um, even though i knew that i knew the state of origin was highly competitive uh, I didn't really anticipate the worry that was actually there when it came around. Knowing how he operates here at Manly, it was, sort of put me in an uncomfortable situation because you know I couldn't stop thinking, well, he's, he's going to be doing the same, if not more, with this Queensland State of Origin side, so it made me very nervous. The remarks and the competitiveness amongst basically Martin Baller and myself who were with Queensland towards uh, Michael and um, you know Ian Roberts, Desi and um, Cliffy, who, who were in the other side, we came, became more and more competitive. I know the, the impact Graham has on players, and, and that sort of uh, series where he's just uh, the players are together for probably six weeks. Graham's the ideal coach to having that because all, all, all a coach can do is motivate a side. Um, I mean, that, that's the cream of, uh, of the rugby league football, you know, foot, of, of the players uh, in the competition. Um, and there's nothing, at that level, there's nothing a coach can teach players anymore. It's just uh, motivation and trying to coordinate the players amongst themselves. I knew, look, as soon as I found out Graham was the, the case of the Queensland side, we were behind that ball straight away. The media had condemned the New South Wales performance after the first game. As for my Queenslanders, win, lose or draw, we'd planned to keep them away from the hype of the Sydney clash for as long as possible. He's not a coat and tie coach. He likes to get with the players. The camaraderie is always. We didn't come good. down to uh, Sydney until the Monday, so we did that for a couple of reasons. One of the main ones was to remove our players from the Sydney environment because um, otherwise they would just be reading continually about what uh, New South Wales was going to do to them, um, and that in itself, again, that that I thought the first game was a classic. The second game, you know, turned out to be one of the best out of origins ever. Defence fantastic from New South Wales. They're up on the uh, Maroon straight away tonight. This man, Willie Khan, gets very, very involved. He'll go in looking for the ball all night. Now it goes to Larson. Larson goes up. He crashed down the turf. New South Wales defence um, in the first, you know, quarter probably of that game, or certainly the first 10 minutes or so. Uh, was just unbelievable and, and it seemed to be made even more ferocious just by the conditions. The crowd was baying for our blood. Um, I loved it. It was, it was great. I, I just loved it there. Um, and it seemed to just inspire the New South Wales team, but they were getting no, you know, like we were still hanging in there, much to their surprise. Giant New South Wales second round Mark Goyer was a man on a mission that night and he certainly rattled a cage of more than one of our players with his smashing defence. I had the feeling right from the very first 
few tackles that were made that he was sailing very, very close to the wind. And as it turned out, a couple of incidents he was involved in could have been a lot nastier than what they actually ended up being. But it involved me in controversy after the game and it, and, and it also involved me in something that, um, that I'm not to this day pleased about. That drama would unfold later in the game. Meanwhile, New South Wales started to put Queensland on the rack. The rain seemed worse than ever and um, while he got everyone behind the post, we sent a quick message out just to try and attack, strike back immediately. Wally was certainly inspiring the players as only Wally can behind the post and um, and we managed to actually get straight back on track again. Ten metres out now, back for Lena. Conditions absolutely atrocious. Quickly across the line to Hunt. Hunt was out. That's a try. Queensland, they've struck back. Willie Kern has scored. That's his first try in State of Origin football. Coming up to half time, tempers were flying, and a Mark Guy tackle on Steve Walters started a good old push and shove that certainly whet the crowd's appetite for the second half. Especially after Wally made sure Queensland had the final say. The most important thing we had to do then was was settle everyone down. Emotion is a big weapon if you use it the right way, but it can also be a destructive force against against what you're trying to achieve. I said, uh, listen fellas, we've just got to put all that behind us now and, and um, we can come back and we can still win this game, but we've got to keep our emotions in check. And it doesn't matter what happens, we just can't afford to get anyone either sent in the sin bin or, or sent off. Um, what we really have to do is try and hit New South Wales even harder and um, I mean, I mean, hit them in defence harder, and um, um, just try and rattle them even more than we, what we were doing at that stage. A claim to come off. Unfortunately, though, as the second half unfolded, yet another incident involving Mark Geyer rattled everyone and caused all sorts of repercussions. Hoff, tempers are fraying. I believe that if, he, if uh, Mark Guy had it connected with Paul Hoff, um, you know, Paul without doubt would have been put out of the game. I don't condone what he did in any way, but I will always be ashamed of the way that I acted after the game because I think I acted in an unprofessional way and I allowed myself to get carried away with the emotion of the whole thing. One thing that overshadowed the, the game, and that was a lunatic running around thinking he was playing 10 years ago when you could get away with whatever you wanted. Mark Geyer would later receive a six-week suspension for the incident. The ball out, only 10 metres. Gary Larson came up with the football. The referee saw that he lost it in the tackle. With 24 minutes to go and a win against the feed, Queensland dealt up their best possible reply, thanks to Dale Shearer. South Wales, turning back enormous pressure at the moment, but for how long can they? Blindside for Langer. Lewis. Once we were in front 12-8, we obviously sent a couple of messages out to try and hang on and we all also used the call Queensland, Queensland, tried to lift everyone up, but um, New South Wales, were, I think they were using New South Wales, New South Wales at the same time. I watched Michael right from the time the score was, the try was scored, and I watched how he acted, and from the way he walked up to uh, receive the ball, the way he walked back to place the ball down, I had absolutely no doubt whatsoever he was going to kick it. I was trying to play against it and blow and goodness knows what, but uh, I had no uh, no uh, doubt.
turned out that's really that Michael would kick it and as it turned out it was a, was one of the great kicks of the season and, and won them the game. Manly making their way out. Four days later Manly and Lowe turned out against Illawarra in the Sunday match of the day. Manly were dealt a hiding but their coach could feel more than the loss of two Winfield Cup points coming on. I'd previously had uh, a clot uh, in January 1990 in my left leg um, and I, I could I could just feel the pain and um, just the swelling, the heat and whatnot that was that was becoming apparent in my right leg. I had a feeling that um, that I was another clot was forming. I should have immediately turned around and gone back, but we went through the game. They put the cleaners for us. Ian Russell stepping right through. Russell is putting players on side. Skipper Leedy's there. Skipper Leedy chased by. Coming back on the bus was just mass depression and um, with everybody. Uh, I went for a checkup on the Monday morning and they rushed me straight into hospital again and diagnosed another another clot. Um, it was just I thought my world had caved in. Anyhow, as it turned out, the, uh, the specialist, um, he had a good talk to me and he said that he felt confident they could stabilise it all. They could get me in a condition where I could leave the hospital. He made me recover mentally and he gave me something to look forward to and he said, um, why wouldn't you be able to go up to, to Queensland? Why, why wouldn't you want to do it? He said, I just want to see your face when we beat you because he, obviously he's a New South Welshman. He said, I want to see you sitting up in that stand when we beat you. So um, he gave me something to look forward to and as it turned out, they took me off the drip at midnight on Sunday night and at 9 o'clock on Monday morning, I was in the cab on the way up to Brisbane to join the camp again. Wally had taken over, and um, I was on a walking stick at the time because I could hardly walk. But Wally just had those blokes ticking over like clockwork. It, everyone had, had uh, pulled together. Um, they'd all... Every, everything had been absolutely perfect, and, and Wally had led them. Uh, at, at training and, and Tosser, uh, the manager had obviously uh, being the leader of, of, the, of the group as he is, he's our leader, he'd uh, made sure everything was done right and, and I knew that we were just ready. Just heavy the New Strong South defense. Wales PR machine had worked the two his blues into an underdog position for the third match. The Maroons had the Lang Park crowd behind them but it was New South Wales who drew first blood. That little kick from Fittler bouncing ball through the chases. Come and chance! Oh, what about this? What about this? Oh, what a dream start for the Blues! What a dream start! Blind side rush Obviously, like it wasn't a dream start for us. Just so Wally's Queensland crew went out and everyone shifted up a gear as we tried to strike back. Gillespie rides into the ground. Langham out to the right. Cut out ball. Lewis. Meninga. Coaching the state of origin so is one of the things that uh, that you're faced with is is that that you know obviously there's some of your own players on the opposition side and um, and um, it's not marbles we're playing and 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 you do have to um, do what you can to to try and um, nullify um, you know the opposition. Well, Michael O'Connor, I saw him as a real danger. Uh, in that last game and um, he, he was going to be playing centre and um, marking Mel Meninga. Um, Mel had also been in very, very good form but uh, Mel's a fair income giant and I can recall a number of times saying to Mel, well, listen mate, it's no good to be in that beat if you, um, if you can't use your size to get some sort of advantage. So. Um, Mel said, what are you saying? I said, well, if you manage to get hold of Michael, make sure he knows you've got hold of him. Obviously, I didn't mean any harm to Michael, but as it turned out, their first, their first clash resulted in Michael getting a broken nose. 
I had to face Michael, who couldn't train. He looked, he looked like he'd been run over by a bus. His nose was spread all over his face, and both of his eyes were shut. He said that when his kids saw him, they screamed in horror. They thought he'd brought a mask home. If I was ever going to have doubts over being the state of origin coach, it would have happened then because, um, you know, Michael is captain of Manly. He's, um, he's a close personal friend of mine. Mel's a close friend of mine as well, and, and here I was seemingly responsible for, um, for, for Michael's looks changing. But um, it all turned out okay anyway. Coming up to the end of the first half, our pressure play was working real good. And when Ricky Stewart missed the kick, one of our guys was looming up and the try was on. I felt the game was there for us to take, but we had to to forget all about the scoreline and just go out and try and win the second half. Just put it back to uh, nil all and just go and try and win the second half and be as cold and as ruthless as what we you know, what we could possibly be. Well, they've got some leaders and they are going forward at the moment on the last tackle. Greg Alexander chips into open space. He'll get this back. Yes, he does, and it's six again. Six to go, Alexander gets it onto Elias. Elias now only 12 metres out. However, early in the second half, Michael O'Connor went about upstaging us and trying to spoil our bloody party again. And to make matters worse, his manly teammate Martin Bella must have gone up to the referee and in front row's language said, excuse me sir, I don't agree with that decision. The referee replied, you're looking tired Martin, have a spell for 10 minutes. I think that's how the conversation would have gone anyhow. Try movement started. Meninga is arguing, Lewis is arguing. Bella's got 10. And then as if to show they were dirty on me for coaching Queensland, another manly man rubbed salt in the wounds with a typical Des Asler touchdown. He's inside the 22. They won't get him. Yes, they have. Is it another movement? Yeah, I reckon it was. Even though I've got Queensland eyes, I certainly thought it was a double movement. I could never return to Manly's Brookvale Oval. Jeez, I'd be shouting for a year if we didn't pull something out of the bag. And then, after a fantastic passing spell, the bloke who came up with the goods was super sub Dale Shearer. and there must be eight or ten passes involved in that movement. It looked like breaking down on a number of occasions. Then it was all up to Mel Meninga to try and win the game for us. Mel Meninga had certainly been inconsistent in his, um, in his goal kicking throughout the series. Uh, I can recall being with him on the morning of the game down at Lang Park. Um, and I was really worried, and I know Mel was as well, also. Um, feeding him, he was kicking like... Um, like a little old lady, that's, that's what his kicks were like. They just, he looked anything but a goal kicker. And Mel has been a great kicker throughout his career and, and I was worried and I, um, I certainly didn't come away from that training session with any confidence and, and neither did Mel. He, he went through his routine, he uh, took a deep breath and said a couple of words to himself and um, those words were probably echoed by every other Queenslander sitting on the ground and I know I certainly said a few. Five metres in for touch, just out on the junction line, 12. Or 23 metres and he, he kicked it. Didn't look a very stylish kick, but it went over. That's all it counts. At this stage, I didn't know if I could last the last few moments. I was also worried about Kevin Walters. He was sitting on the bench and he'd been there all game and I hadn't put him on even as an interchange. And um, I felt terrible about it. So. The moment the game was over, he was the first bloke I went up to and just said, listen, mate, I'm sorry. It's just the way it goes. Without any doubt, it was the highlight of my career. 
this state of origin win, being being involved with it. And I think the circumstances of it, you know, the uh, my appointment uh, initially, um, the controversy that it surrounded it, the the drama of the first two games, um, my illness that, that that I got in the last game, all combined in, in various ways to just make it a. Uh, well, it was a very, very dramatic event and, and um, something that, that, well, I just can't, it, it's, it's, I, I can't recall anything ever being anything like it. It's, uh, it was unbelievable. Look, I had a walking stick at the time and I'd fair dink not been hub, able to walk 20 metres until that, fair dink, that uh, full-time hooter went. And then I felt like I could have run for miles. And Captain Wally Lewis summed up the feeling of the entire Queensland camp. You've only got to have a look at his courage to get uh, get out of bed and come back up here. I mean, co common sense would uh, would indicate that he should have stayed in uh, in the hospital and looked after himself. But the bloke's determination and courage rubbed off on all of the players, and I think that was displayed out there tonight. It's a strange thing about uh, six months ago when Graham Lowe was announced coach of Queensland. There were howls of protest left, right, and centre. And I reckon if you went out in the street at the moment, you wouldn't get one word of disapproval about Lowy. He's a magnificent coach, he's a tremendous bloke, and he's part of Queensland Rugby League for as long as he wants to be. I, you know, hobbled around somehow and uh, going around with the walking stick and, and hearing, I know it sounds like a big note and I'm not trying to big note at all, but hearing the Queensland crowd call my name along with the names of the Queensland players just something very, very special and, um, and I just felt so thankful that I was able to be part of it. Graham Lowe's coaching career began far from Lang Park, Brisbane in an Otahu Council Park which is still full of memories. When I come back here to Murphy Park uh, I'd like to think I'm still the same sort of person now the same coach that I was uh, back in 1973. Obviously, the, the dollars and cents and media and things like that are a little different to, t to say the least, but uh, the principles involved, uh, the communications and, um, you know, the belief in what you're doing, uh, they are the important things to me, and I'd like to hope that they're still the same as what they were then. The first time I uh, run into Graham was we was doing our uh, pre pre uh, training stretches, sitting in the back of our A40, uh, having cigarettes and telling jokes to each other. And this bloke walks up uh, along the park and he's got this clipboard and this whistle and a hat and a brand new tracksuit and everything. We look at him, and we're thinking, who the hell's this bloke? And next minute he comes up to the car and he says, I'm looking for the 8th grade. Can you tell him tell us where where they are? And we says, where it? And he sort of looked in the car and he says, well, I'll tell you something, you better go and get uh, 13 more blokes for Thursday night. And we sort of looked at him and he says, what, why do you want 13 more? He said, because you blokes aren't playing. I think he was just harder. It was, um, it was always good value. He, he taught us a lot about football. He, um, he seemed to know what was going on. He appreciated what, what was happening on a football field and he could relate to players. And the best thing about it all is that he um, treated people like you'd like to be treated. Graham lived and worked at Otahu, and the Otahu Rugby League Club was the launching pad for the big things to come. Well, I had this little uh, auto electrical shop down the road from, from Otahu here. Uh, it was my club, in fact, it still is. And, you know, when I think back now, many a day we used to sit there with a lot of the Otahu players, the juniors in those days, and, and um, think to what we'd do if we were professionals and how we could write the rugby league world or remedy all the problems it had at that stage and we'd pick our own Kiwi sides and um, you know that's where really where the dream started and in and, and those early days did bring uh, success not only to uh, to me personally but to the players you know the likes of Mark Graham and Owen Wright and Primesy etc you know we all, we all shared it together um, and really that's where it all started. Graham's dream of becoming a professional coach came true in 1979 when he went to Queensland to coach Norths in Brisbane. They had run last in 1978 and lost the majority of their contracted players. But in 1980, with a group of young hopefuls, Graham had provided the unbelievable and Norths had made the Brisbane Grand Final. Souths were the favourites that day and um, they had uh, Mel Meninga, a young Mel Meninga at that stage, just making his mark and 
plenty of other good players, but they uh, also relied heavily on on their uh, their toughness, and, and uh, so we set to with a plan that we we tried to test that toughness, and we knew they'd eventually give a penalty away, and uh, from that penalty we hoped to try and start some sort of little bit of uh, set to, and I hope that would work in our advantage. And, and uh, luckily we were able to settle down quicker than what Souths were, and came up with a good try. He gets it away to Gorka, bounces across over there to Draper. Draper turns it back on to Dunn. The big fella's still going. He's over the quarter line. He's still going as Dunn. He got the way to Henrik. He'll score. Henrik's in for the try. Two teams locked together at the moment. Back over to Meninga. He's going to put the boot underneath it. Well, if Joe Kilroy likes the boot to come down at him, well, he's away if he wants to have a bit of a run. Here's the chance. Back into his, in, in goal, into his own quarter, rather. Now turns That game probably more than any other uh, helped launch my coaching career. And provided the opportunity for a few job offers and uh, also the one that came along eventually to coach the Kiwis and provide some of the best moments of my life. Well, the first test I had with the Kiwis was um, here at Carlow Park and um, was a soft underfoot on the day and a little bit grey just as it is today but I always recall back to, um, I, I was so nervous and wanting to do all the right things and I've never been involved with the Kiwis, never been a great player or anything so I didn't really know what the uh, the whole experience was all about but the first thing I recall was was we got called out of the dressing rooms and um, both teams were well, Australia was out there when we went out and I came around here getting really to sit up in my spot just down here and unfortunately the area that had been reserved for us had all been sold off somehow there was a mix-up in the seats and I just looked over from the gate and Arthur Beetson was sitting where I was supposed to be and I sort of looked down he could tell there was no seats and he said for Christ's sake, Lowie, don't sit next to me, mate. That's not going to look right. And I thought, oh, geez, what a good start. So I had to come along. We had to shift a couple of old ladies along down here, and then the game got underway. Game's a little away. Showing some of the speed he was famous for a few years ago. Ron O'Regan. Almost at the line. Ron O'Regan. And the Kiwi's starting to fire. Shane Varley flicks it out. Gordon Smith through Fred Arcoy. Dean Bell back to Arcoy. Can he do something with it? Smith. We're looking every which way, but the Australian defence just holds. Pressure. Real pressure on the Aussies now. Broadhurst. Puts it on. Nice pass to Mark Graham. Nice down to Kirk Sarrison. Gets to the way towards the try. Things were going well for us, and I felt that we were making more breaks than what Australia was making, and we were looking very positive. But um, the game sort of turned against us when we made a break down the far side of the field and then uh, came back this side and we dropped it. As normal, whenever you make a mistake against Australia, they immediately capitalise on it. And sure enough, uh, from the next play of the ball, uh, giant winger Eric Groth just took the ball straight off the ruck area and went through some feeble defence and scored under the post at the other end. sort of turned against us but even though we went down I still come away from this ground with a very very positive feeling. That feeling stayed with the Kiwis as they took on Australia at Lane Park. Oh and mishandled quickly by Australia. Colin Scott obviously a case of the... Kurt and Dane Sorensen you know they, they were just... Uh, Kurt put on a couple of tackles in the early part of that game there that... that um, shook the blooming grandstands, he, he hurt them so much and while we did concede penalties we were willing to do that because uh, we felt that it was going to work to our advantage. There was one incident involving a tackle where little Shane Varley who couldn't dent a grape um, accidentally trod on Ray Price's ankle. Uh, Ray Price responded by stomping on Gary Prone's um, calf. Um, Shane then showed his boxing skills but no damage was, was uh, caused except that uh, we got the penalty. But Primesy got a sore leg out of it, but it was worth it because we got two points. A controversial Nick selection Wright. for that test was Auckland fullback Nicky Wright. Graham had always had faith in Wright, and yet again, a player repaid the coach's loyalty. Well, there it goes. He's made sure and he gets the points too. So the it wasn't only his kicking, it was his general all-round play. And one tackle in, in particular that uh, Mel Meninga made a, a run down the uh, far side 
touch line and uh, it looked like four points for certain coming up at least and Dean Bell was chasing him. Dean may have been able to catch him but uh, Mel being such a strong guy was, was uh, going to be a big ask but Nicky just came out of nowhere. He just came out of nowhere and absolutely creamed Meninga and I don't, I don't know what went on but all I know there was two Kiwis going into the tackle, one Aussie uh, with the ball. Kiwis got up smiling, Mel got up out, the ball had to be put into the scrum and Mel had a blood nose, so I don't know what went on in it, but, but it worked for us anyway. After a strong half-time talk, to make sure the players weren't going to rely on their 9-6 advantage, the Kiwis piled on more pressure with two brilliant tries and absolutely dominated the second half. Australia and New Zealand looking good. Good tackle, Ella. Broadhurst, Varley, Varley, out for Kurt Sorensen, a ball up for Rob Varley, and Rob Varley's in! Oh, I don't believe it! What a great ball! And look at the New Zealanders! They have gone mad here! After a late try by Australia, New Zealand led 19-12, and a dream was about to come true. Graham Lowe looking at the clock, don't forget the famous countdown here at Lang Park. The big clock counts down the last 10 seconds of play. Here's the countdown now, we're in the last two seconds and this is an historic win for New Zealand. 19-12 and there's the count. There was a lot of tension in that game and, um, you know, so much so that I actually was grinding my teeth and uh, all of a sudden I realised I'd, I'd ground a couple so hard the, the, the back a uh, couple of my teeth actually broke off from the side and um, you know just so it's like it's only a game but well, it's supposed to be only a game but I was, I was wound up but, but um, I was doing damage to myself but the players were just magnificent and, and New Zealand I think uh, had one of its proudest uh, moments ever to remember in sport because I don't think the Australians have been beaten since 1971 I think everybody coaches in a different way but um, you know, you shouldn't probably try and copy another style, but my particular approach is I care for the players um, and I'm always proud of them later on. I think that um, the memories that they give you are something that you can't buy and I come back here to Carlow Park today and I think back to those times and to that, that first year in particular when I um, had the privilege of coaching New Zealand. You know, I just love all those blokes and, and I think that uh, I owe them so much. In 1984, Great Britain arrived in New Zealand, having been thumped 3-0 by Australia. But the Kiwis had never beaten the British 3-0 in a series and were still rated underdogs. However, it was obvious from the word go that this was a Kiwi side with a mission. Howie Tamati, through Varley, Kurt Sorensen. Oh, lovely pass to James Norwood! And he'll score right out of the post! Magnificent try! The thing that I remember most about the series was the finishing of James Lillaway. Well, another thing that sticks in my mind is that after the second game down in Christchurch, I was approached by a number of the Great Britain officials and they asked me if I would be available to coach Great Britain. Uh, I thought they were joking at the time, but uh, they were deadly serious. And um, I must say that it, I, I was really tempted. I had one more year to go with the Kiwis and um, I always had it in the back of my mind but they did mention it to me uh, once more after that when I was in, in uh, Wigan, when I was coaching Wigan I was approached just one other time but uh, it, it, I, I, you know, I, I must admit I got a little bit of a buzz out of it. After winning the second test 28-12, the Kiwis returned to Carlaw Park to try and complete a whitewash. This was to be the swan song of the much admired Auckland halfback Shane Varley. Graham Lowe was about to make one of the most difficult decisions he'd face in his career. Shane was struggling, he'd been knocked, uh, knocked around quite a bit in the first two games and he, he took a couple of heavy knocks in that last game. And sitting next to me I had Clayton Friend. I knew that I had to make a decision for the team's sake, but I was trying to avoid it, trying to put it off. Um, and I was watching Shane, I thought, oh, you know, sorry mate, I'm just going to have to do this to you, and, and I called him off. And I can still see him walking down the touchline here. 
And he, he looked me straight in the eye and I thought, he's going to give it to me here for sure, you know, for, you know, just because of the emotion that was involved in that last game. But being the champion that he is, he, he actually put out his hand and he said to me, uh, thanks coach, great, great change, the team needed that. And um, it brought tears to my eyes because um, I know he meant it and he's a team person. And uh, he knew that he knew that uh, the decision was made only because the team needed it. As it turned out, Clayton went on and uh, Clayton scored a couple of tries and uh, turned the game for us. And and uh, that was probably the most one of the most uh, memorable games that Clayton had for New Zealand. The third test ended with a 32-16 win. Graham Lowe and the Kiwis became national heroes. When he first took over the Kiwis, we had good enough players to win games, but. Um, I don't think anyone really believed, or 80% of the players uh, didn't really believe that they could win and he just kept harping on about it and the way he'd um, get people up f even to go to dinner in the, in the evening. You know, he'd, um, we'd have these um, great motivation sessions and he had these neat, really good tapes from America and that about Gridiron and they all set the music into um, poetry in the background. There's these massive great hits going on in the background and people's helmets flying off and, and the like and it was... Real, a real charge up and then you'd turn it off and say right I go to dinner and you didn't feel like going to dinner you feel like rushing out the door and doing a couple of laps or going out and tackling someone or going and playing football so in the end we got him to show him to us just before we went to training and uh, the training was you know we might we might have been doing it 100% but it was 200% after that. In 1985 the Kiwis met Australia again this time in a three test series the first of which was at Lang Park New Zealand scored a couple of great tries Awesome, Filipano with the ball. Beautifully taken. Superb. Dean Bell. Dean Bell in a gap. Trying to run around. Gary Jackson is there. Oh, Dean Bell. Get out of the line. Superb. But it wasn't enough, and Australian John Rebo came up with the first of his match-winning tries that would haunt the Kiwis that series. Who's being sent for Australia? It was ten Unfortunately, the main talking point after the game was the stoush that Greg Dowling and Kevin Tarmody were involved in after being both sent to the sin bin. It happened off the field and was certainly an ugly incident. One imagines they'll be able to sort things out. Kevin Tarmody hasn't lost a sense of humour. Or has he? She's on again. Well, it was always going to be on between these two. The second one was out here at Carlaw and uh, there was a huge crowd. It was a magnificent day and, and our fellows just, they just played uh, exceptional. Wren, puts the pass back. This is coming up quicker. Gary Prune, he's got a gap there. O'Hara back to Prune. Mark Graham it was, Prune in there. James Little want to finish it. And first try to the Kiwis. We did everything to win that game. We had... Uh, movements pulled back for various reasons that could have resulted in tries and and we actually hung on to a lead right till the dying stages of the game and then uh, in the last minute or so uh, we made a mistake and unfortunately that mistake cost us dearly then that bloke has always been a thorn on our side Wally Lewis just uh, Set on a good pass to Gary Jack, who whipped it out to John Rebo, and that was it. Going back into the dressing room after the game, well, I felt selfishly sick and um, down. I went back into the dressing room, and, and um, the players were all. You know, the, the, the state of depression was something I'd never ever seen before and um, um, we all felt that we'd done everything. We all felt we'd, everyone had put in 100% and we couldn't, couldn't understand why we'd lost. And it wasn't until later in the week that, you know, I, I finally woke up to myself and started to realise that, you know, just because you put in 100%, it doesn't give you the right to win. Putting in 100% only gives you the opportunity to win. Recovering from his own distress, Graham then set about producing one of his miracles and setting his men up for the battle of the third test. It's a bloody tragedy, so we must wonder how the football we call a game. But it is a game. 
Don't only look at the pictures, listen to the words. We came as young, untested men from schools across the land and stepped from buses with our bags and soaring hopes in hand. Then on the muscle-sapping sun, we fought the spots that would be won. And sometimes scrimmage tension raised, sprang like a manic tiger caged, unleashed itself in hate. Our number dwindled ever lower, as playbooks were called in. For the goal was to find the best 40 men, the 40 who could win. Then one day, it was just me and you other 39 who charged out to challenge all comers, for we thought we were the top of the line. But making the team is one thing, while becoming a team is another. Is that right? Yeah, I do, so. Yeah. <coughs> forget the numbers, forget <coughs> the games. That is, that is the most important thing, isn't it? We've become a team, but can we stay a team? We trained out at Fowles Park and, and uh, I said to the uh, uh, players, you know, I, I, was, I, I knew, I said, look, I, I know you're going to win. I just know you're going to win. I can feel it. There was not even any doubt in anyone's mind that was involved with our team. We were, uh, you know, dead certs for it. And, you know, it, it was just a, a straight mental thing. And right up on attack again, now the Cubans. Again. They all played exceptional, and um, um, there was just there was just no one you could le you could leave out. And it, it, it's one of those one of those years that just everything sticks in your mind. Everything seemed to work for us in that last game. We just tried to run Australia around, and it worked. And it, the feeling of togetherness. That's what it was. It was a feeling of togetherness. It was a feeling of teamwork. Um, it was a feeling that, that um, of, of time to repay the faith that had been shown in, in, in them from the uh, supporters. Friend, Graham. That was a great team, but Olsen Filipana is the player who sticks out in my mind. He, he, he got the man of the series, and he was marking Wally Lewis, the great Wally Lewis at, um, at his peak, and Olsen outplayed him three games in a row. People trying to take it on the run, he didn't knock it on, running it up. Dean Bell, Dean Bell against Rebo, Dean Bell for the line, back inside, tried to find Gary Prone. Olsen Filipina away now. Wally has spoken to me about it since and said, you know, everywhere he looked, there was just the big frig of, of Olsen just pounding through and uh, you know, he, he just inspired everybody. The test series later that year against the Pong saw Mark Graham's courage, his ability and leadership put the man beyond doubt as one of New Zealand's greatest ever players and certainly the finest I've ever coached. I don't remember the series being drawn. 
I remember the strength of Mark playing on badly injured when his country and team really needed him. And the captain, Mark Graham. You have to realise that um, with Graham, you most probably did it as much for him as you did for your country. You say you were playing for New Zealand or whatever. He, he sort of showed you the values that were required and um, you took it from there. The atmosphere of the great Wembley Stadium enticed Graham to sign with English club side Wigan in 1986. But that wouldn't heal the scars left by that year's disastrous Kiwi tour of Australia and Papua New Guinea. That loss in, in uh, Papua New Guinea was certainly, um, you know, the, probably the low point in my career, and it certainly it, it finished off uh, things on a on a you know real um, sour note for me. And um, uh, losing the job as Kiwi coach uh, immediately on my return um, that didn't help either, I suppose. But them sort of things happen, and. Um, you know, I was going to Wigan uh, while I thought I was going to be coming back in the off-season uh, and, and carrying on as Kiwi coach through till the end of the World Cup series. The New Zealand Rugby League uh, didn't see it that way, so we parted company and um, um, it, it really, you know, I, I suppose it goes to show that wherever one door shuts, another opens. Going to the UK, I didn't really know anybody at all and it was a very, very lonely experience but in some ways it was an experience that I think that actually helped me it made me stronger but I had to quickly establish my authority uh, with the team uh, I had to try and gain respect with the players and um, become part of that society over there. After winning four out of five trophies in the first year, Graham's nerve was put to the test. He upset superstar Ellery Hanley by overlooking him for the captaincy. What happened, Ellery sort of um, became pretty uncooperative at training. And I could see a major, major problem and I knew I had to uh, address it immediately. So, uh, well, I actually left it the first night. I sort of ignored it. I ignored it the second night. Uh, and then the third day we came along to training and um, I tried to front Ellery about it and um, he was pretty um, uncooperative to even talk to. I'd already named the side so I felt there was only one step to take and I called everyone in and I said there's only there's one change to the team and I said Ellery you're dropped and um, he said some remark to me and I said, don't bother coming back either. Some of the biggest names in the game have tried to take him, uh, have taken him on and have lost. Uh, Ellery Hanley in England tried to do it and stand up to him. Andy Gregory, at, also at the same club, Wigan. Uh, he just made it uh, very clear to them that if they didn't want to row in the same direction as the Graham Lowe and Wigan boat was going, that they could hop off uh, and try and find another club. Nobody really does get away with it. Uh, he just lays down the law, put it down to Lowe's law, and it wins. Ellery and I are both hard-nosed, but after about four weeks I was probably thinking a bit more rationally and I gave Ellery a call. After some tough talking by both of us, we shook hands and never mentioned it again. By early next season Ellery would be captain of Wigan, but in the meantime we faced Halifax in the 1988 Challenge Cup final. In just his second year in Britain, Graham Lowe and Wigan had made it to the country's ultimate rugby league final, the Challenge Cup at Wembley. New Zealand had lost their super coach, but he had already conquered England. By Colin Whitfield, but tremendous burst by young Edwards. I know himself now then, this boy certainly got the size and he's over. Well, Kiwi centre Kevin Eero had joined Graham in the 1987 the season, but he hadn't come without strings attached. Right at the last minute he said to me, oh, what about my brother, can you give him a game? And um, I said, what's his name? And he said, Tony. And I said, oh, listen, mate, we only really want you. And, um, and I felt, I had that, like, Kevin's a very, very persuasive fellow, Kevin, and uh, luckily for him, I'm lucky, I, I just feel fortunate now that, it, that he was persuasive. persuasive. But uh, anyhow, I said to him, well, how much has experience has he had? And Kevin said, well, he's, he's one year older than me. And I said, well, how many, you know, what's he like? And he said, he's played twice. And I said, oh, you're bloody kidding, aren't you, mate? And... Um, he said, oh, he's a better player. I think that he's a better player than I am. As they say, the rest is history. Lowe trusted his gut feelings and signed both brothers. They were devastating. Helping Wigan to a 1988 title, toppling Halifax 32-12. 
is necessary at this stage. He's a, a rough, robustious forward. He might share one or two of this run inside. But look at look at Leiden go here. Reminiscent of those two great tries when he won the last turn. He's got to. Uh, other Wigan stars like Ellery Hanley had their moments, but the Eero brothers' first trip to Wembley resulted in three tries. Kevin and Tony got different personalities all together. Um, Kevin is a very focused person. He knows exactly what he wants. Um, he's hard-nosed um, and, and um, he's successful. Uh, he's, he's just got so much ahead of him. It's, um, He's going to be one of the greats of the game without any doubt, he already is. Tony is a, um, Tony's a more easygoing sort of fellow. He's just as good a player. Um, he's, he's bigger than, than Kevin is. Uh, but when you combine the pair of them, they're just deadly. In 1989, Wigan, wearing their alternative blue and white hoops, defended their title against St Helens. Edwards to Platt. That's a good ball to Hampson. Oh, this is good rugby bell. This is copy book stuff. He's got all oh, right in the pass. Well, he's going no into. He scored himself. In the town of Wigan, he was a hero. Graham Lowe was on top of the rugby league world. He'd coached the best players in New Zealand and England. Next would come Australia. Not wanting to be separated from his daughters in Brisbane any longer, Low looks set to return down under. With his record, he was being chased by a number of big Sydney clubs. The Manly Warringah Sea Eagles got the nod. Changed everything and uh, he, sh he ruffled a few feathers really. Uh, and I think a lot of coaches coming into the situation he c was coming into uh, would have done so and, 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 and met with a brick wall sort of response. But uh, he was given a lot of latitude when he arrived and uh, and uh, he really sort of took, took everything by the scruff of the neck and, uh, you know, didn't sort of dilly-dally at all right from the word go. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't in a situation where he wanted to sort of make friends or, uh, you know, introduce things slowly. He came to the club with certain ideas. This is the way it was going to be done and he's implemented those ideas and they're effective right from, the, right from the start. He hasn't sort of taken time to, to implement them. Things like players travelling to and from games in a bus together, strict dress regulations for all players, collar and tie to games. The fact that we all had to go back to the club and uh, be seen and be accountable to our, our spectators. Uh, you know, little things like that but, uh, you know, training regimenting the players to a certain way of training, being ready, if we trained at five o'clock, being ready at quarter to five on the paddock, doing their own warm-up, so when five o'clock started, well, we started, and there was no sort of uh, messing around at all. That sort of discipline, uh, he installed in the club right from the word go. Wherever he goes, he's the boss, and he lets everybody know, not just the players, he lets the fans, and more importantly, the officials know that he's there. If you want him in the club, you've got to abide by his decisions, and uh, if you like, he's a, he's a coach, a captain, uh, chairman of the supporters club and general manager, chief executive of the club all rolled into one. I want to be boss, I won't have anyone else being boss and, uh, and it's got to be done the way I want to do it otherwise I'll stamp my feet up and down and they, they accepted it. Manley also accepted Lowe's decision to appoint the brilliant rugby union convert Michael O'Connor as team captain. He's a naturally gifted runner of the ball and his poetry in motion when you watch him in full flight He's what people come along and, and pay the money for. He's the sort of guy that, that uh, draws the crowds and, and he's a perfect captain for me. Um, a captain needs to be many, many things. Uh, one of the things he does have to do is try and ensure the game uh, plan that you want to uh, uh, use is, is carried out. He's got to ensure that the, the lines of discipline, the standards of behaviour are adhered to. And as long as Michael plays, he will remain captain on my side. But before Manley had started the competition, the new coach was in hospital and seriously ill. It only took them five minutes and they diagnosed it as, as uh, the majority of the uh, veins in my left leg were clotted. All of a sudden, my whole life was turned upside down because my approach to life, the way I, I live generally, everything had to change. Uh, and it had to change, otherwise I wasn't going to live. It was as simple as that. When you see a bloke as... Uh as ill as he was and how unfortunate it was to persist and not give up, um, that can't do anything but lift players and lift people. Um, 
you want to play for Graham. It's, it's, that's the effect he has, and not just because of his illness, but that's the effect. That, that's a that's a person Graham Lowe is. In May 1990, Graham was a surprise spectator at the All Black Trials. He was looking for a utility back for Manly, and one player in particular held his interest. I put a call through to Lloyd Drake and um, um, told him, you know, that we were looking for an outside back and could he keep his eyes open, and um, um, I never thought much more of it. And then just one day, one evening out of the blue, Lloyd rang me up and he said, uh, Listen, I've got a fellow over here that I think you should have a close look at. His name is Matthew Ridge. Matthew Ridge was a second string All Black. He was denied the number one fullback job by John Gallagher, and the presence of brilliant goal kicker Grant Fox denied him a chance to show off his kicking abilities or make the first team. I then got a couple of videotapes uh, of Auckland in various games, and um, while it's difficult to, to pick up the qualities uh, that. Um, uh, of a fullback role as in union as compared to um, to rugby league, it immediately became apparent to me that that Matthew um, he was lively, he was enthusiastic, uh, he was the sort of player who, given half a chance, would play three or four positions at once, um, and he was brave. So I had had a go, I put a call through it in one night and asked. Uh, and said to him that, you know, would he like to play rugby league? And um, he sounded very positive over the phone. And, um, you know, I was impressed with every everything he said to me. He was a determined bloke, very sure of himself, I suppose. Cocky, more the word, I suppose. But um, he, he, he knew what he wanted. Um, he knew it was going to be difficult. He was under no illusions at all uh, on how hard it was going to be. But in saying that, okay. he was also sure that he, that he could make it. <laughs> Matthew settled into rugby league and manly. Under Graham Lowe's guidance, he became one of the most successful rugby union converts ever. Matthew mesmerised the Aussie public with his kicking. And despite starting the season as rank outsiders to make the semi-finals, Manly broke into the last five, meeting Belmain in the first semi. O'Donnell, O'Donnell throws a dummy. After beating Belmain, we were up against the Brisbane Broncos in the second semi-final. We'd been playing well, but a fired-up Broncos side simply out-muscled us on the day with strong-arm tactics. by Miles. Now there was a big swinging arm on that tackle. Two minutes to go. Madison. Got a pass for Jackson. Jackson's in the clear. Jackson will score. Jackson's in for the Broncos. Is he excited or is he excited? We'd lost, we were disappointed, but all of us knew that it wasn't a flash in the pan and come 1991, we'd be able to strike back. Manly's greatest battles of the 1991 season would come against the brilliant talent from Canberra. In the first round, Manly did it easy, winning 46 to 12. Lions holds it up for Tuvi. Tuvi looking for support, gets it away to O'Connor. O'Connor steps through one tackle and O'Connor comes around to score the try. Great hands once more from Manly. On Manly. Manly's got the speed down the flanks to cover kicks like that. They, they, move, they swing it wide here. Quickly it goes out to Iroh. Standing in the centres. Inside is Hassler. Hassler coming through to Belcher. Gets it out to O'Connor. He hangs on to it. Pushes away. David Watson for the line. Chased by Wood. He got there. Yes, Ronson got there, but so did Graham Lowe. Just eight weeks earlier, he'd collapsed with a brain hemorrhage. Though told to take six months off, the day Graham was released from hospital, he visited Manly. And while he did all the talking, he also found in those guys the motivation to keep going. The feeling was obviously mutual. When Graham was sick, the side was sick, you know. When, when he wasn't around us, we weren't performing. And uh, whether that was coincidental, I, I think not. I think that he genuinely does have a big, exert a big influence over the side or the sides that he coaches. And noticeably this year when he got sick, we didn't perform well pre-season. When he was sick last year, also the same sort of thing happened. And then uh, when he was away for the State of Origin games this year, well, Manly suffered. So I don't think it's any coincidence that when, when Graham's not around, constantly monitoring what's going on and talking to players, motivating them and keeping them on that right frequency, uh, the side suffers. Our best performance, in my eyes, was we were beaten in the game against Canberra 14-13. 
Um, but we had a whole lot of injury problems and the players just stuck together. Uh, we were pegged by a point in the end. Um, to me, that that would be the most memorable game, um, even though we did lose. Ian Roberts himself gave me plenty to remember. His comebacks after serious injuries inspired us all. Roberts again! This time it's Coyne! He's trying to lift his side. You want to talk about some emotion here? Look out, Gary Coyne, good night! Lions! Back for Roberts. He's been everything, in everything I should say. Now Rich Jones! In front of the post, on the last, and they're 10 metres out. Lions, field goal time. He threw in the play of the ball. Now Walters. Good hands from Daly to Belcher, to Stewart. Flicking, looking to bring somebody in. Martin, he left Hancock standing. There's the first try. Sometimes you sit there and you feel like you you uh, are conducting an orchestra, I suppose. In other ways, uh, um, you feel helpless. Sometimes you think, gee whiz, you know, you, um, they look uncoached. Uh, or some, sometimes you think, gee, I'm really proud of them. But whatever it is, it'll, you get all the feelings. You get every single f emotion that's, that's possible. You get sitting on the sideline, I believe. Um, and it's just, it's just part of the reason why I do the job. The one word that uh, describes um, what I feel like sitting on the sideline watching a game is probably proud. Cliff Lyons, the captain. Big boots to fill. Graham would have reason to be proud of his injury-ridden Manly side who met the Raiders in the semi-final with no one giving them a chance. It makes you wonder what you've done to deserve such bad luck, but uh, that's the way it goes. I think off the top of my head, well, we had Tony Iro. Uh, out with a knee reconstruction, Hasler out with a knee reconstruction, um, um, O'Connor out with a calf strain, uh, Ian Roberts out with a medial ligament, David O'Donnell out with a medial ligament, David Lydiard out with a shoulder reconstruction, uh, plus a host of others, I can't remember, they're just the ones off the top of my head. So it didn't look too, too good, but um, the thing is about rugby league is the same as anything. You win with what's available. You don't win with what is not available, and um, and that's the that's the approach that we had to to take into the game. This was do or die for Graham Lowe and his Manly Sea Eagles. They had to beat the Raiders in their semi-final to keep premiership hopes alive. Manly arguing that Stewart's tackle was high. Tuvey stays down injured. It was certainly not helped by the fact of losing Jeff Tuvey just in the first five minutes, I suppose, of the game. He got a knock in his eye Tuvey and um, uh, trainer, he had to come off and that was just a, it was a devastating blow for us because uh, all our game plan was basically revolving around Tuvey and Lyons. They were, they were like the steering wheel of our ship and uh, all of a sudden we only had one there. Lyons again, ball was forward and looked at Jones, he can't if we were going to go down, we were going to go down uh, with all guns blazing, or what guns we had. We only had some little pop guns by that stage, but um, but they would certainly be popping away. And, and probably not right of me to think this way, but I did feel very, very confident, um, without trying to tempt fate, I did feel very, very confident that we'd actually win the game. And um, obviously everybody tipped against us, didn't give us any chance whatsoever. Uh, but we went out and the guys played the games of, of their lives. Lions. Stokes. Stokes working with Iro. Too big. He got to the outside. It had to happen. But that is just how he likes them. Now he's got support. Shows it. Now. Iro again kicks ahead. No time! Under the dock! Manly down their own end. Yeah, a lot better. When the ball moves, it's not working. They've got a good forward. Here they go, Ira! He's got Stokes! He doesn't need him at the moment. Here comes Beninga! Back to Stokes! What a try! Oh, what a try! This semi-final is on the line for anyone! Last tackle, Beninga! Stewart!
I were just uh, just spent the whole time going round and round the team, saying, "Come on, fellas, you can do it. Just come on, you've got. Just go out. This is last the last 40 minutes. Just go out and play as you've been playing and enjoy it. Just enjoy it." And uh, there was no big strategy or anything like that. It was just get back back out there and enjoy it. And uh, I did notice out of the corner of my eye that Martin Bella, once he'd sat down, and the bleeding it had start, uh, it started occurring again in his hip because uh, he had this very very bad hip injury I knew that he was you know it was basically going to be impossible for him to carry on but he's such a strong person got such a big heart he said no no I'm okay and um, but he was really limping badly so we got everybody up and patched them all up again and and sent them out and um, um, we really look forward to that last 40 minutes Bruised and battered, Manly fought back, but there was no way anyone was going to catch Mark Bell. Bell! Bell gets cleared, and they catch him. Iroh's chasing, Hancock's chasing, Hancock's flying, but too late. As simple as that. But what a chase. The score Ten minutes into the second half, Martin Bella could no longer take the battering on that injured hip. You're always, um, you know, very, very disappointed when you've got to come off, I think. I mean, you know, I pride myself on be able, being able to go the distance and still be going hard when it's when it's finished. But, um, you know, there were just too many of our guys that were too knocked around, but full credit to the guys that uh, that replaced us. You know, if, if a couple of things had have gone our way, you know, that quite well could have, uh, could have been our game then. Last tackle. But the Canberra Raiders, and Gary Coyne in particular, seem to be on a roll. Suddenly, the match looked to be slipping away from the Sea Eagles. for Manly isn't whether they're capable but Lowy's boys it's weren't giving side. up and they five minutes later they were they back in the game score a try and go on and win the game Williams gets it to Ronson Ronson gets it back to Williams Williams to Cunningham they've got it and it will be six points I tell you what that reserve bench might have to be more back again forget about the ice Manly's euphoria was short lived the Sea Eagles are not finished Unfortunately, we had a try disallowed at a crucial time there that um, could have had a big bearing on the result, but it's the sort of thing that you, that you do have to accept because the referees are under a lot of pressure and um, any mistake they make is obviously well documented and highlighted, but um, it, it's certainly it's no compensation though and it doesn't give you any comfort to know that sort of thing, but it was... It was basically a six points that we dipped out on. Williams! Williams has Iro! Iro couldn't get there. Hancock does! Oh no, he's got it for going forward. If anything should have happened from that particular movement, uh, the referee says that the ball went forward. Uh, well, I don't think it did. And I don't think anyone at the ground other than the ref thought it did as well. But uh, if there was anything other than a try that should have come from it, well... Uh, we should have possibly been awarded a penalty because Kevin Iro was tackled without the ball. But, you know, those decisions, that's decisions the referees make, they do and can have a dramatic effect on the game, but I believe you've just got to accept them in the spirit of the game. This is unbelievable defence by Canberra. Manly were determined to strike back, Manly's and Matthew Ridge led the charge. The pressure on, and I'd be very surprised if Canberra don't crack in the near future. Now, Ridge! Ridge! Ridge takes it! 10 metres out. He put his head down, believed in himself. Lions! Oro! Oh, there it is! Yeah, they cracked! Oh, what a semi final finish coming up! Matthew is, without doubt, in my, in my opinion, the number one fullback in the world. And um, But he's not a very big fellow, Matthew. But I think he forgot his size. I think he thought he was Martin Bella for a while. He, he put the ball under his wing and put it into. Um, turbo and he took off straight at them 
The game's biggest controversy would come in the dying minutes as John Jones was penalised for lying on the ground when he appeared to be injured. The score in the end was um, was unfortunate. Um, you know, being penalised from John Jones being on the ground as he was and then obviously being injured seemed unfair, it was cruel. But that's what, that's what sport's all about. Um, you know, everything's good. When things are going well for you, it's good. Uh, but you've got you to understand, understand and accept that things won't always go well. A lot of people are going to call it a harsh penalty. The referee allowed play to restart and Canberra scored before the injured Jones could leave the field or his replacement could get onto the park. was over for the Manly Warringah Sea Eagles. Graham Lowe was heartbroken. Well, you just, uh, you, you just feel sorry for everyone. You know, there's nothing you can do and you just feel sorry. It was the end of the toughest year of his life. A year when many people would have just given up. Probably if I had a dream and um, something that I hoped could happen. I, I, I just, I just hope that I've always got the energy to uh, to fight off any feeling that you might have at different stages to give up. You know, whether they be through uh, things not going the way you want them, or or um, you know, health-wise, or, or anything. You know, it's it's easy to spit the dummy out sometimes and and just sit back and put your feet up. And having the energy and and uh, uh, that great feeling when you open up the blinds every morning and looking outside and and seeing a sky and, and knowing it's a new day uh, coming. The energy to, to look forward to that day and to complete the day, that's all I look forward to. So what makes a man who was once an Odahu auto electrician into a world beater? Why is Graham Lowe admired like no other coach and regarded as the game's master yeah, motivator by call. those who've been closest to him? He knows how to treat people and that's what it all comes down to. It's a people thing. And Graham can make an average player think he's a good player and again, a good player think he's a great player, and a great player think he's unbeatable. He's be, really been responsible for internationalising the game of rugby league, I believe, and lifting, lifting it, its image over the last decade. He's a bloke that I think uh, is one of the best managers of people I've ever run across. Uh, there's a very, I think there's a, quite a ruthless side to him, but you know, he's found that quite an effective sort of weapon. The one thing he's done which most people can't do is temper that and, and use it when it's got to be used and only then. This guy loves the game of rugby league and the people in it. And there are those who just love the man, like the manly fan who summed up Lowe's year in this poem. We watched as he buried his face in his hands, but sat straighter still in his chair, for it hurt to look out at his pain-ridden team and think of the misery there, the pain and the misery there. He is proud, justly proud of the way you performed, for you felt so sorry, so sad, Praised loudly your character, spirit and heart. You tried hard. What a game you all had. A magnificent game you all had. He was ill, really ill. But he came to North Head, watched you train, further illness he braved. And the way you responded meant so much to him. He considers his life you have saved. So cheered by the way you behaved. You've touched part of his life now in some special way. Ours too, be it finish or start. Not a team has your courage. You've won the big prize. Your supporters, you've captured our hearts. Our love, our devotion, our hearts. Shed tears for them. No, no tears. All detractors put to rest. 
the eagle's motto now should read, the good, the better, best. The more you look into the man's life, the more you realize that he hasn't learnt this special gift. Graham Lowe was born with it, and we haven't seen the last of it yet.